And so uh, it was from verses one through 45. And uh, if, you're, if you read it this morning, you would have had read the, the recounting of um, raising Lazarus from the dead. And as we're wrapping up, the, this is the fourth Sunday of the blessed month of Abib. And we were focusing on uh, the life of the apostles and um, the blessings and the rewards that come from that. And so uh, the theme of this month has been seeing our Lord support his apostles. He gives them authority. We remember to serve with humility. Um, we remember uh, obedience to receive his blessings. And we see the great reward as being raised from the dead in the fourth week. And so there's a lot to unpack from the gospel of today. There's 45 verses to look at, but I'm only going to focus on one small part from verse 43. Okay, and, and we're going to reflect on this. So I'm looking at verse 43 in the gospel of St. John chapter 11. Um, the words, Lazarus, come out. So what can the words Lazarus come out tell us about our life in Christ? In fact, those words tell us a lot. I know it's a small phrase, but it tells us about the one who calls, the one who hears, and the one who continues to hear and to respond to these words, the one who are baptized in Christ. So let's unpack. Let's take a look at the first part, the one who calls. The, the Gospel of St. John is especially known for including a number of signs that point to the divinity of Christ. And the Gospel of St. John includes seven of these. Uh, the event of raising Lazarus from the dead is a seventh and the last of, the, of these signs. And it really marks the, the climax of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. In addition to telling us about the work of Jesus, the Gospel of St. John also tells us about who he is. In the beginning, it begins to flesh out that answer to the question that Moses posed, right? Moses, who posed the question to God at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, when he asked God for a name, and God answered, I am. And so according to St. John's Gospel, Jesus begins to complete that sentence. He identifies himself with, with the God of Moses. And he does so in different ways, right? The various I am statements. And in the account of raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus proclaims, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so to, to understand more fully who it is who calls Lazarus come out, it's helpful to look at what happens actually immediately prior to this event. If we look at the Gospel of John chapter 10, right? So Lazarus being raised from the dead is coming from John chapter 11. What I'm saying is it's important to have a certain lens to read that passage. And really helpful to look at John chapter 10, it gives a new light, a new um, lens to look at this, uh, this amazing miracle. So what happens in the Gospel of John chapter 10? Our Lord also identifies himself as the Good Shepherd, right? The one who cares for and gives life to his flock, right? He is the shepherd of the sheep in verse 2 of chapter 10. He is the one who calls his own sheep by name and leads them out of the gate in chapter, chapter 10 verse 3. This implies that he knows his sheep and has a relationship with them. And the sheep follow because they know his voice. This is verse 4 of chapter 10. And, and further in the story, Jesus identifies himself not only as the shepherd, but as the gate. It's the gate itself, saying, I am the gate for the sheep. This is verse 7. Proclaiming that those who enter by him will be saved. This is verse 9. He emphasizes that he came to give life and to give it abundantly in verse 10. And then he builds on this identity with the God of Moses, claiming that he is not only the gate, but the good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for his sheep. The one, and this is in verse 11. Okay. So the good shepherd is the one of the most tender descriptions of God in the Bible. From the very beginning of the Old Testament to the very last book of the New Testament, right? The Bible refers to God as the good shepherd no less than 80 times. And there is no other passage like Psalm 23 that captures the essence 
of what it means to be the Good Shepherd, right? This psalm gives comfort and hope and strength um, more than any other psalm. Consider for a moment a picture that the Psalm 23 gives us about the Good Shepherd. The shepherd leads the sheep. He goes in front of them to remove the poisonous plants and to shoo away the wild animals. And he finds a shady place for them to rest. He finds pasture for them to graze. He satisfies their thirst by leading them to a drink of still waters. He is with them even though they walk in dangerous places, right, through the valley of the shadow of death to protect them. He anoints them with their bruises. He anoints their bruises with oil, and at night he leads them into safety in the, in the sheepfold. And when all the sheep are in the fold, he lies down across the narrow entrance so that no wild animal can get into the sheep unless it passes over the shepherd's body. And so, seen through this lens, the lens of the good shepherd, the event of Lazarus becomes, you know, an exemplar, right? The the a perfect example of the relationship of the shepherd and the sheep, right? To summarize, when Jesus receives news that Lazarus is sick, he doesn't immediately leave to go attend to his friend. No, in fact, he proclaims that the illness of Lazarus will not lead to death, but be for God's glory. And when he arrives in Bethany, Lazarus has been dead for four days. It's a small detail, but important. The small detail is important because it reflects the Jewish belief that the soul, which stays in the body for three days after death, has left. So he's dead. He's fully dead. Not just in a coma or not near death, but he's completely dead. And when Martha professes that if he had just been there, right, her brother would not have died, Christ assures her that her brother will rise again. And it's here she proclaims that he says, I am the resurrection and life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. He is not only the gates to the Father for the sheep, but their path for life. So in the story, in the event, our Lord is greatly moved by Mary's tears for her brother. And after he prays to the Father, he calls out Lazarus by name. He says, Lazarus, comes out, come out. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. He is the good shepherd who cares for his sheep and later will lay down his life, his own life for them with the power to take it up again. He is the owner of life and he calls his own. See, in society, we may be a nameless statistic to people, but not the good shepherd. He knows you by name and he calls you by name. You know, we may be distracted in life. We may forget about God, but he doesn't forget about us. We may try to leave him alone, but he doesn't leave us, right? When we are baptized and confirmed, each one of us becomes a member of the flock of Christ. He becomes our shepherd. He defends us. He feeds us with his precious body and blood. And he guides us. And he knows us, each one of us. And he calls us by name. And he gives life to each one of us. And so he calls out Lazarus by name. He says, Lazarus, come out. Okay, so what does it, this event tell us about the one who hears his words? The Lazarus comes out. We know from the gospel that Lazarus' sisters cared for their brother when he was sick, and they sent word to Christ. They had faith in his healing powers. For example, in verse 21 of this account in chapter 11, Martha says, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. And then Martha confesses her belief that Jesus is related to the God of Moses. He, she goes on to say, he is the Messiah, right? The anointed one, the, the son of God, the one coming into the world. This is in verse 27. And so when they heard the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lazarus, come out, they were filled with hope. From the gospel, we can see that they're, they had a prior relationship, right? Our Lord and the sisters and they noticed that Jesus emphasized, Lord, whom, he whom you love is sick. The one who, is, who you love is, is ill. So the, they had a relationship. And upon hearing the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lazarus come out, Lazarus responds. He knows the voice of the shepherd. He is released and he is given new life. Although he is still under the power of death until the last day, 
He is given life in Christ now and the opportunity to live more abundantly. See, our Lord used the language and illustrations that were understood by the people of that day, right? To understand what he meant by the door. We need to remember that in those days, the shepherd would gather the sheep at night into the open air and the sheep folds for protection. And these sheep folds were enclosed by a wall of thorns around the top to keep, you know, the wild animals away. And the shepherd would station himself at the narrow door to call and call the sheep to come in. And he would call each one in by name. And after the sheep were in, he would light a fire to frighten away the wild animals. And then he would wrap himself in a blanket and lie down across the narrow door, which was the only entrance. There is no way in except over his body. And so when Jesus was saying that he is the door, he is saying that he was the means by which people would enter into safely and be protected from danger. St. John Chrysostom says that the door or the gate is the word of God. So if someone is trying to lead people in a spiritual way without using scripture and the correct interpretation of the scripture, then they, they're considered an imposter. How can, how can the sheep tell if there's an imposter or the true shepherd? Jesus says it's because they recognize his voice. So how can we recognize his voice? Well, it's very simple. We have to become familiar with it. If we're not immersed in the scripture, if we're not really engaging with the gospels, with the epistles, right, as revealed and shared with us in the life of the church, we will not be familiar with the voice of Christ. It's that simple. Think of how much exposure uh, we give ourselves to other voices. Hours and hours of celebrity, hours and hours of politicians, of gurus, of friends and family members, but we barely even spend a few minutes at the door of the Good Shepherd. Each day, in personal meditation, or even like an hour or so, even in the liturgy. We, we try to manufacture other doors for to salvation. We try to make doors of education, or doors of philosophy, or the doors of science, or the doors of positive thinking. But Jesus said, I am the door, not a door, the door, the only door. And so the door of true teaching from the one good shepherd requires a response on our part to believe and to follow. It requires our free will to participate in the will of God. It's not forced. It's not automatic. It implies that, that we can become like some of the Jews that Jesus told, but they didn't believe. And, and so we have to reflect on some important questions. Do we hear the voice of the Good Shepherd? And do we even recognize his voice? Do we trust him and obediently follow him? Right? So Lazarus, come forth. And then this event tells us about the ones who continue to hear and to respond to the words of the shepherd, the ones who are baptized in the new life of Christ. So we're reminded of the Psalms that we are still the ones who need to be helped and who the Lord helps, right? The Lord is my, my helper and I will not be afraid. And so like Lazarus, those who baptized into Christ are called by name. We're not afraid. As the Lord who creates and forms and redeems us has called us by name saying, you are mine. Right? This is recalled in Isaiah chapter 43. He says, you are mine. We are his. We are marked for Christ. Like, like his friends, we trust in our friend and find ourselves in a community who has faith in him. Like Martha, we confess our belief in Christ as the anointed one, right? And are anointed in a similar fashion. He is our good shepherd, the one who lays down his life for his sheep so that we might be saved. And so through baptism, we participate in the death and the resurrection of Christ. And like Lazarus, we are born anew and given the opportunity to have life and experience it more abundantly now. Our Lord calls by name. 
whether we realize it or not, God knows us, all of us, and he knows all about each one of us. He knows both the good and the bad. He knows everything about us. Yet, no matter how far we have fallen into sin or away from God, Jesus, the good shepherd, loves us. He loves us so much that he lays down his life for us. He laid it down on the cross to defeat sin and death. He lays down his life so that we may have eternal life with God in heaven. So what does this look like? From the Bible narrative, we don't know much about the life of Lazarus after this event. But like anyone who has been given a new lease on life, one can imagine that he might have looked differently at the world around him. He had experienced a glimpse of the power of the resurrection. And his, his, he must now have a new perspective of a life in Christ. Perhaps, perhaps he let go of any grudges that he had carrying with him, which is encouraging for us to do the same. Maybe he worked uh, to repair a broken relationship. Again, encouraging for us to do the same. So although Lazarus's resurrection is very different than that of Christ, it wasn't just a resuscitation. He was called out not just to repeat the same patterns in his relationship with others, but to move beyond them, repairing them, to transfigure them. Perhaps we could look at our own relationships in such a light. And so we can assume that like him, we are given hope, not only in the power of the resurrection that we can experience now, but in the ultimate resurrection on the last day. So just some concluding thoughts. Imagine what Lazarus felt. He was in Hades and he heard the voice of God all the way in Hades. He brought and he brought him back in an instant, in a flash. He knew the power of God and those around saw the power. As Jesus said with a loud voice, Lazarus come forth. And so Jesus invites us to walk with him and he amazes us with his signs and his wonders and his love and with the experience of his nearness. And instead of, you know, instead of paying attention to him, we lose focus sometimes, unfortunately. And then the obvious happens, right? Death surprises us and, and failure sneaks up on us and people disappoint us and sickness attack us and temptations overwhelm us. We say, Lord, if you had just been there, right? But the Lord is where he has always been. He's been in our hearts this whole time. It's our attention. It's our focus that has, that has wandered. Some of us weep. Some of us have no words, right? Like Mary, we have no words, but we only weep. Some of us, I suppose, are a little bit stubborn, a little bit more uh, stiff-necked. And maybe we need more disappointment to turn our gaze from what is outside of us to teach us to see what's inside, right? To see our Lord in our temple, in, in our own bodies, in our hearts. Jesus is the resurrection. Even when death seems to be winning, right? Our Lord is the resurrection. Even when our loved ones don't understand, Christ is the resurrection even when the church seems broken. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And when we believe in him, although we die, we shall live. And as we live and believe in him, we will never die. It's a mystery only known in the heart where Christ lives, where both life and death teach us to focus our attention. The same voice calls each one of us. The same voice calls all of us to come forth. The same voice says, I am the resurrection. If you believe in me, you will have eternal life. We must believe. We must understand. And we must live according to the way of Christ. So don't linger outside the door. Step inside. Inside you will find salvation and security and peace and love. And when you find your life and it finally comes to an end, you will find that at the last door, the grave is not a closed door, but that it's one that's open. 
And there you will find Christ, the Good Shepherd, standing at the threshold of eternity to take you by the hand and lead you into the joy of everlasting life. And glory be to God forever. Amen. And so um, let me...